Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Depending on where you're sitting right now, it's so lovely to be with each of you. What a week in the Daf Yomi uh, that we're going to have a chance to review and think about and learn about. It's like the moment where you walk in for Torah reading on Shabbat morning and uh, there are all these things happening, people being called up, page numbers being announced, things are happening without you understanding them, without you knowing them, but now you have the key. You know exactly what's happening. It's all from the third chapter of Masachat Megillah, as we, we just started to learn a few days ago. We're going to start our discussion, um, our lightning review, the weekly review of the daf, with the end of chapter two, which uh, for me is soaking wet and crinkly in my Gemara because it was during the beginning of the surge here of COVID. We were outdoors and it was pouring rain. So I will always remember this when we get to uh, the next cycle. Um, this page is very crinkly. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, reading of the Shema, who is able uh, to do this, who is able to recite the blessing for other people, who is able to lead the benching for other people. We actually talked about the role of a minor. And with that, I just want to actually look at the end of chapter two. There was a very interesting discussion about when we do mitzvot, right? We talked about reading the Megillah, during the nighttime versus during the day. Um, and we, just as a reminder, halakhically, we read both at night and during the day, but these two readings have different, uh, different halakhic statuses. Actually, we read at night, the official time, and then there's like a repetition during the day. But that said, the mitzvot of the day of Purim happen during the day. So why that's important is actually sometimes people bring Mishloach Manod, or different things that they want to do for Purim to fulfill their obligation to the Megillah reading at night. But actually, that needs to be done during the day, according to the Lacha. That's the core time for performing the mitzvot of Purim. As we can see on 20b, that's where I am right now, the entire day is valid for reading the Megillah. And the entire day is valid for a number of other things as well. But if you kind of think through your mind, When's the last time you've been to a bris at night, right? Very, very uncommon, not seeming to be invited halachically, right? This idea that during the day is the time to perform a bris. Um, but you might have been to a bris perhaps in the afternoon, towards the afternoon. Um, there's a custom to do it closer to the morning because it's just a good thing to get mitzvot done earlier in the day. So it's the idea uh, with the bris in the morning. Okay, so I'm skipping forward to Daf 21. 21, as we begin the third chapter of Masachet Megillah. Question about reciting the blessing on the Megillah reading. Uh, the, this particular Mishnah introduces us to the idea that we're supposed to read Torah on Mondays, Thursdays, and also on Shabbos in the afternoon. We talk about three people coming up to read, uh, and also not being able to decrease from that number or add to that number. Now, why is it that the Mishnah and the Gemara are so careful to let us know that on certain days, and you can put this in the chat, this is, this is an invitation for you, on certain days you may not add aliyot, you may not add numbers of readers to the Torah, what do you think? What does it say? Why is there such an obsession with this? You can't add on certain days. Aliyot. Now, of course, we also know that you can't reduce, and that has to do with honor, according honor to the Torah, giving significance to the Torah. But why not add? What's the problem with that? Let's see. Does anyone want to give it a go in the chat? What's the issue? Oh, yes. Neri, exactly. We have to get to work. This idea that on certain days, on days when work is not prohibited, we are supposed to be productive human beings out there in the world, except, of course, for those 10 Vatlanen that we also learn about in this week's stuff, the 10 dudes who uh, kind of are always available to make a minion whenever we need. Um, they're not working. Other than them, we're all going to work. And therefore, we are not supposed to uh, elongate the Torah reading, the public Torah reading, longer than necessary. One theme I wanted to focus on today that really comes out of this week's stuff, a big theme is actually the ways in which people are weird about shul. They come late. 
they leave early, they prepare food before they leave for lunch afterwards. There are all sorts of things that actually people are people about when it comes to shul. And when we talk about, you know, um, if you think about the latest, mo most recent drama in your synagogue, um, if you have one, if, if you, uh, um, I'm just going to mute for background noise. Let's find that. One second. Hold on. Trying to find it. Me too, sorry. Really a lovely, lovely sound. I just want to, okay, we're good. Um, just, there are all of these things in which you know, the, sorry, latest drama, latest drama in the show. If you think about it, it goes back to the times of the Gemara, right? Uh, the times of the Mishnah, all of these things are here already. So let's keep that in mind as we continue our review and go through to figure it out, uh, these particular issues. Um, if you want, uh, Rachel, you can give me host powers and I can uh, do it also. I'm sorry, I am awkward at managing Zoom. I'm looking for the mute all button. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. Folks, if you could mute yourself, some people have background noise coming through, and I'm incompetent at hosting Zoom meetings, so if you No, all good, all good. That way. Um, okay, so taking a look here at the Mishnah at the beginning of chapter three, we also see the source for the uh, Zehaklal, this idea that any day on which there is a Musaf, there's an addition, but not a Yom Tov. You have four people called to read from the Torah, Yom Tov five, Yom Kippur six, and Shabbos seven. All of these different things. Um, Rachel, if you can also make me co-host and I can do it. If I'm looking for that too. Okay, okay I'm sorry. Awesome. Do you know, no, Tassi, do you know? Um, if you go to my little thingy do and then my three dots there should be a make co-host sorry sorry guys for the good oh also, okay I, I find you in the list got it yeah. also do you like how i called it a thingy do shows my technological proficiency i don't yeah yep um got it oh there you go sorry folks no, you're good. <laughs> usually ben does this for me all good. All right. Okay. I think we should be good. All right. Yeah. Let's go. All right. So we also began uh, in chapter three with a discussion about sitting or standing while learning Torah. Actually, the preferred uh, position for learning Torah is actually to be standing while learning Torah. But we got weak after Rabban Gamliel died. And now, the, since the glory of Torah has, has left the world after Rabban Gamliel died, we now sit while studying Torah. Uh, if you ever have heard of a shtender, right, um, that literally means something that you stand with and learn with, uh, means to stand, right? Uh, but shtenders, this idea that to, to stand and learn and really support yourself while you're doing so is this idea of, of greater honor for the Torah. And there's a discussion in the halacha about sitting versus standing for different kinds of things. What kinds of things require seatedness and focus and other things require standing and according honor to the Torah. There's a discussion about Moshe actually neither sitting nor standing, but being midway, bowing um, in, in the process of receiving the Torah. Uh, we discussed this idea that there will also be other people, uh, actually this, this emerges from the daf, but not directly from the daf, it's a custom that actually comes from the daf from this week, that there should be two other people up there while the Torah is being read, a uh, God by Rishon and a God by Shani. And now it comes from the daf because we learn that God and Moses are there when the Torah is being given. And so this idea that there, there's a God and a Moses, right, in the process of the Torah being passed on to the Jewish people in the public Torah reading. I also want to invite anyone who would like to put comments or questions in the chat as that I can address or we can talk about together. You can also just note your favorite thing that happened from this week's off or anything else. Okay, I am on 21B, continuing in our journey here. We learn that you may not have two people reading the Torah at once. What's the problem with two people reading the Torah at once? Well, if anyone has ever heard the mourner's Kaddish, sometimes recited by multiple people at once, it's hard to discern words, 
right? Like things are, are a little bit staggered. It's hard to hear. And there's a principle in a, valach, in a halacha called trekale uh, lo mishtame. Two voices at once cannot be heard. And that's not appropriate. When you're reading the Torah, you need to understand the words that are coming out of the person's mouth. And similarly, by the way, since the Aliyah used to be recited by the person reading from the Torah, some are also careful to only have one come up for the Aliyah as well. Different, however, for the Megillah and the recitation of Hallel. Why? Mipnei kevan dechaviva yahavedataihu. Because those two things are beloved. Reading the Megillah and reading Hallel, those are beloved to the Jewish people. And so therefore, what? We're going to listen more carefully to the words, even when it's hard to hear. Now, if we're going to start to squirm in our seats a little bit, what do you mean? The Megillah is beloved, but the Torah isn't? Now, hey, the Gemara is letting us know that, yes, for, for certain times of the year, it's actually more exciting for us to be in shul. It's more exciting to actually listen uh, to the words, what's being recited. And if you can think about your own experience, the Megillah is something we really, really pay close attention to. So therefore, it seems to be that the Gemara is suggesting, oh, two people can read the Megillah at once, unlike for the Torah. It's very interesting. Another note from this week's staff about the reality of being a person, right? Um, that sometimes certain things are more beloved to us than others. Okay, so continuing on, we learn on 21b, and uh, continuing on all the way on the bottom to 21b about the concept of saying a blessing before doing a mitzvah. Usually we say a blessing over last yatan, before we do a mitzvah. You can think about, let your mind kind of go through all of the different mitzvot you've ever done, right? Uh, and what blessing is said on them. And then how usually you say the blessing and then do the action, right? So that's pretty standard. There are a few cases in which that's not the case. Um, and our, our DAF actually tries to explain what does over mean? Well, how do we know that the word over means doing it before and not something else? So that was what we discussed on the DAF. But in the halacha, there are actually a couple blessings where we don't do the mitzvah after the blessing, but rather we do it before or during. One of those is going to the mikvah, which is interesting. So we actually immerse in the mikvah before saying the blessing on the mikvah, and then we dunk again. Now, why is that? Why would you say a blessing when you could be like immersed in holy waters first, right? <laughs> so that's the idea behind that. Also, nitzilat yadayim, right? Similar idea. Why would you say the blessing without kind of doing this amazing holy thing first? So we do it, uh, you know, we, we say we do the action before and then we say the blessing. So that's one thing. Shabbos candles, also another example of how that happens. Um, okay, so I'm looking in the chat. Bring it on. Keep it coming. Shoes. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Excellent. Keep them coming. So we talk about the uh, on the bottom of 21B, the 10. Why do we have 10? 10. Uh, 10 sorry, 10 verses as a minimum for the Torah reading. We talk about the 10 unoccupied people who hang out in the synagogue, 10 batlanen. We talk about the 10 praises, the 10 commandments. We also looked at the minimum of three readers, how three symbolizes something as well. Now, one thing I would like to think about with all of you, and I would love for you to suggest it in the chat, what you might think the answer is, why are we so concerned? with making sure there's a minimum of three verses per aliyah, right? Why are we so concerned? Three verses per aliyah, three aliyot on a, on a you know, Monday, Thursday, a Shabbos at Mincha, 10 in the, in the whole section. Okay, we get it, it's important, but why are we so, so concerned with the symbolism of each of these things? You can let me know what you think. There are a few exceptions to this rule. One famous exception, to reading a section that is less than 10 verses in length. Anybody know, put in the chat. We read a part of the Torah that is less than 10 verses in length, but we do it anyhow. Okay, you can put in the chat if you, if you can think of what it is. It's nine, nine verses in length, but not quite 10. All right, so you can put that in the chat and we'll come back to it in a moment, but we're gonna continue on to page uh, 22. Let's go to Chaf Bez 22. We talk about this question of whether or not you can divide the verses of the Torah. Yes, Michael Stock. 10 points to Michael Stock. The verses of Amalek. 
right? The Parsha Sahor, it is under 10 verses. Um, how does it work with points and my Jewish learning? Do we mail them Torah points? Torah I'm covered? pretty sure like, it's like, whose line is it anyway? The points are made up and they don't matter. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. In that case, Michael, you get 600 points. <laughs> Amazing. So the question of needing to fulfill the minimum number of verses, what happens if the section you're in does not have enough verses to fulfill the minimum? And there's a really interesting debate between Rob and Shmuel about how to do that. Rob says what you do is you repeat one of the verses in one of the aliyot, and Shmuel says, no, you divide one of the verses in half. There's a very interesting discussion that limits the ability to divide any of the verses at all in any parts, except for the sake for the sake of teaching children, teaching school children. And that's why this particular approach is not the one that ends up being accepted. It's not what we do today. We don't divide verses in half. We repeat when we run out of verses uh, and we have to make sure to reach the minimum. Uh, we also discussed, and I probably skipped this already, but the importance, which Aliyah is the most important one to get or to read? Do you, you remember this? Thumbs up, you remember this on the top. So interesting. Well, is it the first? Is it the last? Is it the middle? And ultimately what we say is they're all important. We look at them and we explain why each one has a particular level of relevance. One of my favorites is the middle aliyah because of the, the, uh, the lamps in the temple all kind of facing towards the middle. The middle is the most important. The last is the most important. The first is the most important. Each of them is important. Okay, so continuing on in the DAF, let's hop to page 23. 23, um, there is a question of why it is that Rav, when he was visiting a particular city, did not make a blessing after the Aliyah that he, uh, he received. And there's a whole discussion about how it is this was possible. Now, why it is I want to highlight this on the DAF, because we get into a discussion about if he's special, right? If, if in, for some reason he's special, or if this was merely something that we can learn about the halacha of how to read from the Torah. So that was really interesting in addition to the concerns about what happens if people come late or leave early. Um, I am so down for Duff Jeopardy at all times, whenever you want, just, you know, send me a message and we'll do it. Um, okay, so again, on 22B, we learn about uh, this idea that any day, any day on which there is a loss of work caused to the people by keeping them late in shul, like a public fast day or Tisha B'Av, uh, three people are called to the Torah, but on other days you have more from this. Uh, we also learn on uh, Daf 22, the idea that Rosh Chodesh was a holiday for women. Now, how do we know that? Because it says here on 22B that Rosh Chodesh uh, is a day on which there is no loss of work for the people, like everyone goes to work on Rosh Chodesh, but then Rashi comes along and is like, except the women, right? And there's a discussion about that, how the women resisted uh, the process of the golden calf by refusing their jewelry for that process and instead volunteer their jewelry for the temple, right? And so Rosh Chodesh becomes the holiday that they are a part of, they are rewarded with. Now, why Rosh Chodesh? A lot of really interesting discussions in the Rishonim and the early authorities about why Rosh Chodesh, but one of the most fabulous ones, very interesting, refers to a midrash about the diminishment of the moon, the, the light of the moon, and how as a reward for the, their resistance to the golden calf, at the end of the day, the moon will shine just as brightly as the sun um, at the end of days. Very beautiful idea. Um, okay, continuing on. Uh, oh my gosh, it's already 9.50 and that's, that's what happens on these things. Um, all right, we talked a little bit about tachanun falling on one's face and a related issue, uh, being able to bow down on a stone floor, which we are not allowed to do. And even the idea that there are different kinds of bowing, full prostration on a stone floor would not be permitted. Uh, other kinds might be permitted. And there was a really interesting question about how, how it was that Rav could, fall on, could have fallen on his face or did not want to fall on his face in a particular shul if everyone else was. What do you mean? Rav observed this particular halacha, but everyone else didn't. And the answer of the Gemara, this was fabulous, was that, oh, no, 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 the stone floor was literally right in front of him. And the question further after that was, why didn't he walk a little bit to 
the re left or right. Well, he didn't want to inconvenience the people uh, by asking them to stand up in his honor while he passed before them. Really interesting. Um, okay, so on yesterday's daf, we learned some uh, very powerful gemaras. Um, two days ago, we have, of course, the the, uh, the principle of kavodah tzibor that all are uh, all are able to go up and read from the Torah, even a child, even a woman even a woman. Gotta love that. Um, and except we don't permit it because of this idea of kavod hatibor, the honor of the congregation, the dignity of the congregation. If you are interested um, in learning more about this concept, kavod hatibor, there's so much interesting buzz on the internet um, among modern authorities about this particular concept. It becomes the core cog in the wheel of where progressive orthodoxy lives. Um, so kind of like the left wing of modern Orthodox Judaism, how it is that women participate in the Torah service really kind of fall upon this area of halacha. What is the dignity of the congregation? It seems to be women are invited to participate in the Torah service. And if we didn't have this, this issue of the dignity of the congregation, they would be able to. Now, what is this, the dignity of the congregation? It means that if a woman or a child or whatever it is is reading, it must mean that the men don't know how. And therefore, it is like a slight to the dignity of the congregation if any of those people read. Now, obviously, there are uh, lots of ways to understand what this means, the dignity of the congregation. And my recommended reading for you is a very extensive article uh, by the Frimmer brothers, Rabbi Frimmer, you can, you can look it up, um, and Rabbi uh, Dr. Daniel Sperber with a, an, an article on the other side, very important halachic articles of of our um, of our generation uh, about Kavod Atzibor. So similarly, we learn about the source for Minyan, uh, the, the idea that a, a minimum of a quorum of 10, and as we learn about from this, this, uh, this staff, 10 men, um, where does this come from? Now this, you know, th I was explaining to my Daf Yomi class that meets every night. I said this Daf 23 of Tractate Megillah is the Daf of the Gemara, no question that keeps me up at night, every night. I mean, I'm an Orthodox woman who runs a shul who does not read from the Torah or count dominion. So this is like a <laughs> uh, very, very interesting and important daf for me. Um, but this idea of where minion comes from, look at the sources for minion. Uh, we look at a Gezeira Shava, a very interesting uh, idea, as we take two words that connect in two different places and we apply one law to the other. But what we have here with minion on daf 23b, is actually a double Gezeira Shava. It's like a twice removed, you can look at it carefully, but the two examples brought are, one is the story of the spies and the other is Korach, right? The Eda of Korach, the group of Korach. This is a very negative place to start when you think about what makes up a quorum, right? Um, like what does make up a quorum? Oh, you know, the rebellious spies and rebellious Korach, that's a, that's a quorum of people. But what do you think about this in terms of what makes a quorum really looking at the most negative groups of people? I think a powerful idea to take away from that is because human beings do have the capacity to come together and do some really icky things as groups, it's very powerful that we choose to come together to do the opposite, right? We say we come together to elevate God's name against these terrible things that we could possibly do. And yes, anyone is welcome to join um, for my nightly daf yom shir. There are a number of people who, who join join here as well. Um, I don't know, Rachel, if you want to put the just the link of the shtibel in the chat or something, that's where we the, the link is. Is that um, where they'll find information? Yep, there's a link to the Zoom okay. room every night and then Friday morning on Sunday morning. I will okay. pull that up. Thank you, and I'll try as well at the end. Um, so we also talked about other things that require a minion, a quorum of 10. So wh whether you understand this to be, uh, you know, about the uh, 10 men or 10 women, however your community counts 10, take a look about how interesting this list is, right? We say that you need 10 to do special things around mourning and around wedding as well. These required places where communities must be present. Uh, very interesting. Uh, and especially during the time of COVID, 
how we've really grasped and needed these moments of community and haven't necessarily been able to have them. Very, uh, very interesting. Okay, so on today's DAF, and this is where I want to conclude in the last couple of minutes, uh, very important DAF about how to translate certain areas of the Torah and even censoring certain translations so as not to, uh, you know, say bad things or say things in a bad way or, or cast dispersions on the Torah at all. Uh, we're worried about our congregations and saying bad things about the Torah. So that's on today's stuff. I want to conclude with um, just skipping back to yesterday's stuff, 24B, the story about someone who is blind, uh, someone who is blind, not according to Rabbi Yehuda, being able to say the blessing on the Shema, the first part of the blessings on the Shema, which is the Birkat Tamaora, the blessings of the luminaries. Rabbi Yehuda is like, hey, someone who's never perceived the luminaries with their eyes, they shouldn't be able to say that blessing for others, right? Um, now, there was a very, very interesting story here that I think is a beautiful place to end. Uh, the story on 24B about how the sages do permit somebody who is blind to, re to, uh, to say the blessing of the luminaries. There, they say, well, actually, there's a story of Rabbi Yossi who talks about a man. Uh, he found a man who was blind, who was walking in the dark and actually carrying a torch. And they have a conversation about this. It says, One time I was walking in the darkness of night and I saw someone who was blind who was walking and had a torch. And I don't know what you think of this, but Rabbi Yossi asked, well, why did you, why are you carrying this torch? What do you need it for? And he says, well, my torch is here and then everyone else can perceive me and see me and help me and be a part of this with me, right? This idea that we're supposed to create a world in which we're all able to step up and help each other is a very powerful thing for looking at the third chapter of Megillah. What does it mean to make the Torah accessible to all? And I don't only mean with a kind of a classic disability lens, I mean translation, I mean people who are late, I mean a few days ago we talked about um, how women and men needed to prepare Yom Tov lunch, and so therefore Shul needed to start later, right? And we learned that women were cooking and men were watching the children. Both of them needed to come late, and so therefore we start Shul later. I'm just like, I was verklempt. I was just blown away by this week in the DAF just saying, we don't read Torah and we don't have Shul from an ivory tower, right? We figure out how to illuminate it for everybody. We figure it out. Um, and so that's actually something for all of us to chew on and think about, I think, as I've, I'm just concluding, how is it that we think, you know, especially with COVID, especially with how everything has been turned upside down, how can we make the public reading of God's word more accessible to others? And again, you can look at it, on, on a, yeah, amen. You can look at it with a, a kind of a classic disability lens. You can also just think about who's not in the room and why, and what we can do to actually ensure that everybody not only is hearing the words of the Torah, understanding them, but also like, even if they go to the bathroom in the middle of an aliyah, like, do they know what's happening when they come back, right? Just very, very simple things. So with that, my friends, may the third chapter of Tractate Megillah accompany you for the rest of your lives. It does for me. Um, and of course, we'll revisit it in, in a the cycle again when we meet again in many years and of course we'll be holograms by then so we'll be sitting around a conference table thank you so much for learning with me and as a reminder um you're welcome always welcome to join uh join my class every night at 8 p.m eastern except friday mornings at 7 30 eastern and sunday mornings at 8 30. so i'm gonna put it in the chat have a wonderful shabbos wonderful day Robbie Fruchter, they're asking for the password to your class. We've already listed the link. Okay. But they're saying uh, it needs a password. Link. Password is that, and you can always just let me know. Um, All right. There, it's a six-digit number in the comments, folks. That's the password to the class. Also, um, I am Googling but haven't located the articles you mentioned by the Rabbi Sprimmer and Rabbi Dr. Daniel Sperber. Would you mind sticking around for a minute to, to help us locate those? Because you bet. people were interested. Yeah, of course. I'll just stay here for one minute. Everyone who needs to leave is welcome to do that. Um, but have a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
if you're hanging around for those article citations, we're going to try and have those for you in a minute. Wasn't sure how to spell frimmer. There's one. That one's good. Um, and we've got this. Oh, one M. Okay. No frimmer. F R I M E R. Ha. <coughs> yes. I was I was Googling with two M's. That's where that's where I went wrong. I'm going to get you Rabbi Sperber. Here we go. This one's the biggie. Kodatsibor. That's some. Awesome. That was my quick and dirty kind of get getting of these articles. Hopefully they're, um, they're the right one. Thank you. It, it's better than me taking a stab on Google for everybody. So thank you so much. I'm going to, I'm going to leave the chat. I'm going to leave the meeting open for a few minutes. So people have a chance to grab the links and the passwords and the information they want out of the chat. Cause there was so much good stuff here. Awesome. And I see we still have 55 people on with us. So I'm guessing they're still they're still looking thank you very very much it was wonderful as so always glad. so glad you were here thanks for oh, learning yeah. I, I i'm trying to come back to you too <laughs> i thank you again wonderful bye 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 i still didn't get the pass password password for the um for the classes yeah what i'm going to pop it in the link again yeah yeah but but i'm having problems accessing anything on the link um is it, i don't know is it okay if you say it out loud yeah sure it's 522-305 okay thank you so much it was fabulous i'll see you um, later lisa bye okay thank you have a good job good job whoops <laughs> Automatic transcription said, have a good shot. <laughs> <laughs> have a great shot. All right. That's for, that's for after, sh after services. After, after. Yeah. If that's your thing. All right, team. <laughs> All right. Well, anyone else need you, anything? With COVID, you need your shots before the service. Hey. Oh, that's a different kind hey. of shot. Yeah. <laughs> there, there you go. Nice you know, go. Do you ever, uh, yeah. Yeah, do you know where, uh, we can work on? Uh, Talmud and Aramaic. Did she leave already? Um, I don't know. Rabbi, Rabbi Fruchter, are you here? Um, so the, I, I think a good starting point could be the Koran Bavli. I've got it right here. You know this okay. this volume. They they have um, they have <coughs> Aramaic and English side by side, and the translation um, is pretty readable. Okay. This is published in the last of Yumi cycle by Corin. 